Have you ever felt that knot in your stomach as you walk into a room full of strangers? Have you ever stumbled over your words when just trying to introduce yourself to somebody new? Have you ever felt like this guy? Well, if you have, and it sounds like many of you have, you are not alone. Current research shows that 60% of Americans identify as shy or dealing with social anxiety. 60%. And I know exactly what that feels like, because I used to be just like him. So 10 years ago, I started an organization called Dreams for Kids DC. And we help young people with disabilities to play sports, everything from adaptive hockey to water skiing, every sport you can imagine. Kids, families loved what we were doing. But a year into it, we're on the brink of running out of funding. So you can imagine my excitement when I get this invitation to a conference that journalists think of as the Davos for social entrepreneurs. And best of all, we get an invitation to come for free. So when I walk into this hotel on day one, am I thinking to myself how excited I am to talk to people like Ariana Huffington, Mark Cuban, and other major donors? Definitely not. I'm on the other end of the spectrum, freaking out, thinking to myself, who am I to be hanging out with them? These people aren't going to care about anything that I have to say. So here I stand, stressing, when all of a sudden I see one of the founders of the conference who comes around a corner. We lock eyes, and he says, Andrew, come with me. We're going to a nonprofit pitch-off. Outside me says, yeah, let's go to a nonprofit pitch-off. Inside me thinks, what the heck is a nonprofit pitch-off? So we zip through this lobby, he barrels through these double doors, and then I see it. This large round table with 30 philanthropists sitting on the outside, 30 nonprofit CEOs sitting on the inside. The founder gets our attention, and then he says, nonprofit CEOs, you have 60 seconds to tell your story and then rotate. So you remember how I told you that I was freaking out when I got to the conference? Well, now my brain decides to go full-blown panic mode. Yes. Panic mode. So that looks like me starting to sweat right off the bat. As I work around this table, I'm trying to impress these people so badly, but I can't get the words out. As soon as this event was done, I walked out, I'm in my head, and I was just thinking, that was your shot, and you just blew it. And I was so disappointed with myself, I literally pulled out my phone to call a cab. Every part of me wanted to leave that conference. And right in that moment, my conscience comes in and it says, don't diss this event organizer who gave you a free ticket. You need to tough it out. And I did. And later that night, I remember that I'm leaning on a railing, just looking at this cocktail reception happening below me, just still dejected from what happened earlier that afternoon. And then this guy walks over, starts chatting with me. And the conversation naturally dives into our shared love of hockey just becomes two guys having a chat about something they loved. No agenda. And believe it or not, this random guy becomes our first major donor. His contribution enabled us to create six more clinics that year, hundreds of kids playing the sports that you see here. Now, I realized that if I had given in to that pressure, if I had left that conference, I never would have met that man. I never would have got that donation, and who knows what would have happened to Dreams for Kids and all the young people that we were serving. This became my personal moment of reckoning, because I've come to realize the most important tool we have to create the life we want, that tool is communication. And I learned that day at the conference that if I couldn't feel confident, I could not communicate. And if I could not communicate, I was never going to build the meaningful relationships that I desired. So after that conference, I committed myself to understanding interpersonal dynamics, the so-called soft skills. And I started in all the places that you might imagine. Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends, Robert Cialdini, Influence. And I learned about the science of persuasion, how to meet new people, ask open-ended questions, read body language, you name it. And these things 
Well, they worked to a point because we raised more money, we got more sponsors, we sustained Dreams for Kids. As I got better at these things, I started to work with nonprofits, Fortune 500s, training their employees in the art of meaningful conversation. I started to coach venture back CEOs on high stake presentations. And one day I woke up and found out Forbes had called me Dale Carnegie for the digital age. And now don't get me wrong, I'll take it. But the truth? The truth is that behind all this veil of success that I'm achieving, I'm still dealing with the same insecurities that I had all the way back to eighth grade. This imposter syndrome when I meet someone who I think is more successful or smarter than me, still getting dry mouth before big presentations, and still this constant pressure to be liked. Even though I liked my life, I was proud of what I was doing. I was starting to realize that the source of this social anxiety was this constant need for validation, this compulsion to impress people. And as I talked to friends, colleagues, clients, I realized that so many of them felt the exact same thing. And now, I get that social anxiety was a helpful impulse for much of human history. In the Stone Age, getting kicked out of your tribe was a literal death sentence. So worrying about what people thought about us, that made sure that that didn't happen. But today, we take this way too far. We care too much what people think about it. And this is the exact thing that makes us feel bad, frees up, and keeps us from connecting with the people that we want. And this influx of social anxiety, it's driving us into a connection crisis. And I'm not being hyperbolic. Research came out last year and found that 50% of Americans currently identify as lonely. 50%. Workplace Solutions did a study a couple years ago and found that at work, 60% of corporations cannot find the candidates they need because of a lack of interpersonal skill. The CEO of LinkedIn said the biggest skills gap in America, that's not coding, it's communication. So if we want to prepare people for the future of work, if we want to end this literal epidemic of disconnection, if we truly want to help people deal with social anxiety, then we need to go beyond what we know. Because there is a social skill that none of us were taught. And that skill, that skill is called social flow. And social flow is the ability to create a flow state with people. So to understand it, it's helpful to think of the last time that you experienced a flow state. So what was your sport growing up? And if you weren't an athlete, what's something that you just loved to do? Maybe that's cooking, reading a book, creating music. Okay, now go back to the last time that you were in the zone. When you went beyond thoughts, time slowed down, your body gets filled with that focused energy to do the thing you needed to do. You got it? That's a flow state, the peak state of human performance. So imagine what it would feel like to create that while interacting with people. You can. And that is the practice of social flow. It's based on the idea that when we learn to value what we have to say, other people will too. That we can train our brain to detach from the need for external validation, approval, and permission. And when we do that, guess what? We start to achieve those things with much less effort and stress. And to create this state, all we need to do is focus on something called a flow trigger. So a flow trigger is just a condition or an action that helps us to drop into flow. And for the last three years, I've been working with my clients to uncover the triggers that can help us to drop into social flow. And I've distilled the best three into a question framework that you can use to practice social flow wherever you go. Are you ready for those questions? Yeah. All right. So, the three questions of the social flow framework. How do I want to show up right here, right now? What do I want to know about this person or situation? And last, what do I want to share that feels real and meaningful to me? And let's work through these questions right now so each of you can practice social flow as soon as we're done here. So question number one, how do I want to show up right here, right now? So 
One thing that I have learned is that when we put our attention onto our intention, we create the experience that we want. So rather than focusing on how other people are thinking and feeling, external force we do not control, shift that focus onto how you want to feel. It's an internal force you do control. So let's take a moment. How do you want to feel right now? Is that confident, focused, energized? Take a moment to anchor into the experience you want to create. That's question one. Question number two, what do I want to know? So this question will replace our compulsion to impress with a desire to learn. And anytime you want to set this curiosity compass, you just ask three questions. Any three questions, set those before a conversation. It could be what they do for fun, what they're looking forward to, what's their dream job. But when you ask, what am I most excited to learn about the person I'm about to meet, you will change the dynamic of that conversation. So question number three, what do I want to share that's real and meaningful to me? We ask this question because life is too short for small talk. This question will check you in deeper with what you're actually feeling, with what you're actually interested in discussing so you can contribute that. And so to check in with this authentic voice, we can think, what am I currently excited about? What am I learning? What's challenging? And so now you have the three questions of the social flow framework. So anytime you get lost in anxiety, discomfort, doubt, you can come back to the questions and what you control. And I want to bring this full circle. So you remember that conference I talked about, that Davos for Social Entrepreneurs? Well, last year, I got invited back. But this year, it wasn't as a participant. It was as a speaker, leading a session on team communication. And so as I woke up on the morning of that talk, guess what? That same anxiety bubbling up in my stomach. That voice that once said, who are you to be a participant? Now said, who are you to be a speaker? But you know what was different this time? I had those questions. I refocused on what I could control, and that made all the difference. When I went into that session, I was in the zone. A woman walks up to me after the talk and says, thank you for the share and for making me feel less alone in this. And you know what's great about all of this? Is that she's not alone. None of you are alone. And I'm not alone. Because social anxiety... The desire to be liked, worrying what people think about us. These impulses are hardwired into our operating system. We're all going to experience them. But how we respond, how we respond is completely up to us. And now you have a tool to interrupt social anxiety and introduce social flow. So wherever you go and whoever you're with, Take a moment to check in, because if you want the world to value what you have to say, it helps when you do first. How do I want to show up? What do I want to know? And what do I want to share? And then, go with the flow. <laughs>